<laughs> Thank you very much. A great pleasure to be here. My day job is training the next generation of outstanding teachers at the University of Roehampton. I do other cool things too. Recently stepped down as chair of NACE and have been involved with some of the development work on the new computing curriculum. Um, I have far too many slides here to get through in half an hour, so I'm going to go through this at a rapid rate of knots. My apologies to anybody who was hoping to watch on the live stream. I'm doing a recording on this machine rather than beaming out live, but I think the audio is there. Hello, everybody. Um, so talk briefly about policy, not in the direction of, the of theory because this is like an academic conference and I feel I have to. I'll tell you a little about the students who we get, sorry, I beg your pardon, trainees we get to work with at the University of Roehampton, the courses that I'm responsible for, share with you some of our trainees' work and some of their thoughts, or at least the bits of the thoughts which they're willing to commit to paper, and then give you a few bullet points to wrap up with as where we go next with this particular agenda about computing education. This, in the last days of the previous government, we came up with this definition, or rather Jim Rose came up with this definition for QCDA of what constitutes ICT capability. It's not a bad definition. If I hadn't put it up on the slide deck in front of, sorry, on the screen in front of you, you could have come up with a lot of those words yourself, I'm sure. We have skills, obviously. We also have knowledge and understanding in there. We're looking at confidence. We're looking at competence. We're looking at independence. And the thing a lot of my trainees forget about is this, the importance of managing risks and staying safe online. That's not bad, is it? But it's very much about using technology and using technology well. This bit of work takes us off in a very, very different direction from using the technology. This is about understanding the technology and about understanding the principles of computation and through them understanding the world. How we got there from where we were, where you have people like Ian Livingston and Alex Hope commissioned by uh, Department of Culture, <laughs> Media and Sport to say what can be done for the UK visual effects and games industry. And they say number one recommendation is address the beginning of the pipeline. Let's put computer science on the national curriculum as an essential discipline. This gentleman, Eric Schmidt, who knows who Eric Schmidt is? Oh, that's a relief. I, audiences of teachers, I don't get quite so many hands going up. Eric Schmidt controls more people's access to any information than almost anybody else since the Reformation. Um, let's have a listen to what he had to say about I was this. I flabbergasted to learn that today computer science is not even taught as standard in UK schools. Now, your IT cur curriculum, by the way, focuses on teaching how to use software, but it doesn't teach people how it's made. This risks throwing away your great computing heritage. Okay, now to be fair, the old curriculum did have programming on there and one would have thought Eric Schmidt could have found that out by, I don't know, like Googling it or something. <laughs> um, you also then have an august body like the Royal Society coming up with 18 months of research commissioned by university computing departments and some of the industry to say what can be done about the position of computing in school. And they say part of it's a rebranding exercise. This ICT brand is damaged goods. Those of you in the room, who's got GCSE ICT and willing to admit to it in public? Okay, I've got a few hands going up. I'm so sorry for you both. <laughs> we, we, we have this sort of damaged goods aspect of that, which I think is unfair. Um, you know, there's a lot of really, really good work going on. But they say that one of the things which we need to do is rebrand it. Instead of calling it ICT, let's call it computing. And let's recognize that there, there's more to that than just using office skills, which again is an unfair criticism in my view, that it should include digital literacy. Sorry, Doug, they've gone with the singular form. I don't ask me. Um, information technology and, of course, this computer science stuff. You know, in Livingston, Alex Hope, the Royal Society, Eric Schmidt standing up and saying something should be done sooner or later. This gentleman takes notice. Oh, I'm so sorry, we can't hear from him. <laughs> Come on. Imagine a dramatic change. In just a few years' time, once we remove the robot of the existing ICT constructed curriculum, instead of children, what would out of their minds being taught how to use Word and Excel by teachers, or even more We could have 11 year olds able to write simple 2D computer animations using an MIT tool he goes on. So his, his, his suggestion is the problem was the ICT curriculum. I think an unfair suggestion. We want more computing in school. 
let's get rid of the ICT curriculum and let schools do whatever they want. Didn't actually seem to work out like that. A lot of us wrote and said, look, if you want to see more computing, that's not the right way to go about it. So he rejects the advice of the um, National Curriculum Expert Panel, some of the advice from the Royal Society, and says that ICT continues as a national curriculum subject with a new statutory program of study for all, all four key stages from September 2014. So there's the public commitment to that. Unlike all of the other subjects being reviewed as part of the National Curriculum Review, he says, I'm going to do it differently. As with so much IT, he decides to outsource this one and bring in the British Computer Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering to provide advice on how to do that. Small working party to write the first draft, share that draft out in public in October. Again, this is different from how they did all of the other things. Revise that draft, iterative development process, send it back to the DfE and see what changes they want made. We did that. We handed it in about 4.45 on the 30th of November, 5 o'clock deadline. It's not just your students. It really isn't just your students. The DfE then have a look at what we've done and say, go and do it again properly. Well, they say that to a couple of people at any rate. Shorter statement of the subject aims, get rid of the one about being critical. We don't want any sort of that criticality, thank you very much. Asking for all sorts of trouble. Emphasize more, more emphasis still on computer science, strong links with the maths curriculum, and let's not worry so much about the digital skills, hey folks. Um, so he stands up in the house on the 7th of February and says, we're going to change the name as well. We're going to replace the odd ICT curriculum with a new computing curriculum with the help from Google, Facebook, and some of Britain's most brilliant computer scientists, and me, obviously. Um, I remember one meeting when there were people from Facebook there, or somebody from Facebook, but they didn't think they said anything. Never mind. They probably liked it. Um, so this is what we have in the preamble to the new computing curriculum. Compare and contrast this with what you had from Jim Rose on ICT capability. This is significantly different. Okay, This is computer education allows you to understand and change the world. I'm looking forward, by the way, to Ofsted inspections, which say, how's that going? Are any of your pupils managing to change the world through the power of computational thinking alone? Okay, We have creativity. Why did Jim Rose never mention creativity? We have, of course, important word for the Secretary of State, rigor. Um, purposeful, creating purposeful and usable architects is a good thing. But notice this em emphasis on understanding here. The word comes up through three times, admittedly saying the same thing three times. That's like teaching, isn't it? You three-part list, but always the same thing. Um, and again, we have there in the preamble this notion of computer science, information technology, and being digitally literate, successfully avoiding whether we're going for singular or plural forms there, Doug. Okay, the aims for computing are fourfold. As I say, we've got rid of, about, of the one about being critical here. Fundamental principles of computer science being able to code, which is a different thing, okay? The craft of writing software, an element of being able to evaluate and apply IT, and also being responsible, competent, confident, and creative. Hold on to the word creative for a little while's time, because then we get into the detail. Key stage one, this is what children should be taught in year one and year two primary school. That's age six and seven. Three of those points are about that computer science stuff. Understand what algorithms are how they're implemented as programs, being able to write and test simple programs and use logical reasoning to predict the behavior of simple programs. It doesn't say you've got to do that on a computer, yeah? or in a traditional laptop, desktop, computer fashion. It could be one of those lovely little floor turtles, B-bots, is what we now have. So you're allowed to interpret that however you want. There's no canonical interpretation. But notice the focus on programming. Key stage two, there's more of this. Oh, and indeed the word algorithm. That upset a few people. Key stage two, more of the same there, designing and writing programs for particular goals, including control or simulation, sequence selection and repetition. You get academic computer scientists involved, and rather than saying if, then, or repeat, they have to say selection and repetition in programs. We know what they mean. To, well, I knew what they meant. Logical reasoning to explain how the algorithm works. Remember, more than just coding on here. Understand computer networks, including the internet. By the age of 11, understand the internet. It's a noble ambition, though. It really is. Okay. Understand how they can provide multiple services, such as the World Wide Web. Oh, yeah, a nice bit coming in, slipped in at the end there. Opportunities they offer for communication and collaboration. This is my favorite of the whole thing. Describe how internet search engines find and store data. Um, see me after tea if you can tell me how an internet search engine stores data, please, without using Bigtable and GFS. Okay, so that's quite a difference to what we've had thus far. 
Uh, key stage three gets even worse. Key stage four, two bullet points. Just uh, what does it carry on? And what is keep calm and keep coding or something? Keep calm and carry on coding. That was it. So the teaching agency, the government, the part of the DFE that deals with teacher training, says, okay, we've got to make some changes now. So we're not going to offer, any, not going to fund any secondary school, secondary ICT training places from now on, or from this September 2013. Onwards, cease to allocate any places for ICT. Wait for it, there's a reason why. In order to provide schools with teachers who can deliver both rigorous and stimulating teaching in computer science. Okay, um, we are, however, going to have postgraduate computer science programs, and we're also going to do about something about subject knowledge enhancement. Most people are trained to be secondary school. ICT teachers, as well as computing teachers, as will be, have degrees in things like game development or web design or ICT or business studies or things like that, not computer science. So even for IT graduates, a certain amount of subject knowledge enhancement is going to be necessary to equip them to teach the new syllabus. So again, we have an expert group convened that comes up with the list of what that sort of subject knowledge should be. When we put it together, we also we included primary subject specialists. They're, the DFE teaching agency aren't going to fund specialists for computing in primary school, but this was the list of the things that we had in mind for them. And that's a long and quite a meaty list for somebody to be a specialist teaching this in primary school. Okay, um, I'm going to have to move on. Uh, the British Computer Society, or at least part of the BCS, the Academy of Computing, says, OK, we're going to fund the 50 best, or we're going to get some money from the DfE to fund the 50 best of these, the, these secondary school computing teachers. And they get a £20,000 you know, tax-free um, scholarship to train to be computer science or computing teachers in secondary school, which is something, but 50 teachers isn't going to go very far amongst sort of 4,000, 3,000 secondary schools. I forget the exact figure. We changed the syllabus. The Secretary of State says people have told him that ICT has been really boring in school. They may have had a point in some schools. Um, we up the entry requirements, say even in primary school, you've got to know all of this really complicated stuff. And then people express a degree of surprise when the numbers enrolling to do computer science, PGCs, for next year are way, way down on what they were. We're looking at the moment of recruitment about 25% of what it was two years ago for the old ICT PGCs. So, brand new syllabus, really demanding stuff, but nobody wants to kind of come and train um, teaching that. So there's a challenge there, and I think we're going to see some work done on that. Well, I hope so, at any rate. One of the, thing, the other things I've been involved with, and this launched yesterday, I went live onto the internet yesterday, bit.ly, ITT Comp um, is a collection, we're curating a collection of resources under the teaching agency's auspices, uh, but without their sort of you know, direct say, these are the resources for those who wanted to train primary school teachers in delivering this new challenging, exciting curriculum. So you've got that there as a resource for those involved in digital teacher training in the primary phase to draw on for this. Which brings me to Roehampton. This is where I work. Isn't it lovely? Okay, not quite as nice as, 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 as Plymouth. This is Grove House at Froebel College. This is actually where the Vice Chancellor's office is. My office is made out of breeze blocks and some distance away from there. But Roehampton, like a couple of other institutions, is a collegiate university. I'm based in Froebel College. And Froebel is a really, really interesting person. Mitch Resnick, the man behind Scratch, works at the lifelong, or chairs the lifelong kindergarten group at MIT, and he Steve thinks he's cool as well. Transforming inventions. But as I think about great European inventions, it's not these that I think about. For me, the greatest of all inventions came in the uh, 19th century. That was the invention of kindergarten. So as some of you might know, it was around in the 1830s that Friedrich Froebel invented the first kindergarten. And you might think, well, what's such a big invention about that? You know, just opening a school for younger kids? But there's a lot more to it than just saying, let's bring younger kids to school. Froebel saw from the beginning that a very different approach to education and learning was needed. At the time, most education was just about a teacher standing in front of the classroom, lecturing and kids writing down word for word what was being said. And he knew that something very different was needed for five-year-olds. So, Mitch Resnick explains it a lot better. But one of Froebel's great insights was this notion of 
the frugal gifts, these series of presents which are put into the hands of small children at early stages in their development. And this is somewhere around gift five, six, somewhere in that sequence. And we still put building blocks into the hands of small children and before they get to school, and indeed in the very, very earliest years of school. The reason why we do that is not so they become construction workers or architects. The reason why we give them things like that to play with is because through playing with blocks like that, they get to understand some of the fundamental properties of reality, conservation of mass, conservation of number, conservation of volume, that gravity works downwards, that some structures are more stable than others. And the idea behind that you can see as the inspiration for something like Scratch, which is MIT, Lifelong Kindergarten's group, brilliant, brilliant visual programming interface, hugely popular in primary schools, and very much the basis of our programming work at Roehampton. Of course, playing with something like that, you might yet go on and become an architect. And Frank Lloyd Wright went to a Froebel kindergarten in the States, and there are those who argue that there's a link between his early experience and some of his later work. It's plausible, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, a nod in the direction of theory, obviously, constructivists at the, at the core at Roehampton, that this understanding of the world lies at the heart of the educational process, and that playing with objects, the experience of objects, real or virtual, plays such an important part in that process of developing those mental schemata. And of course, Roehampton social constructivism, that we learn not just through the play, through experiment with the objects, but through talking about that. And so much of our experience is something which we appropriate from, through, from others through the power of language. And we also need to acknowledge Papert's contribution here of going beyond Piaget's work of constructivism to constructionism, that so much of this you learn best through the act of making something, through building something. My understanding in how is, is developed every time I put presentation slides together. So the Roehampton students, you can't read that even from the front of the room, I know. But what we have there is a survey of the last two cohorts joining Roehampton of what they're good at on computers. And bizarrely, they seem reasonably good at using social networking software. That's top of the, second from the top of the list there. Using social software, Facebook, Twitter, TS, forums, blogs. I've got over 70% of my students describe themselves as either proficient or expert when it comes to that. Bottom of the list is the problem form. Programming, DBOTS, logo, creating macros, office applications, developing web-based applications or software, I have what is the figure there? It is two-thirds of my students. First lecture of the course tick the box to say they have no knowledge, no experience of doing any of those things. I think they've forgotten about the floor turtles back at primary school, but they still tick the box. And so few of them are able to tick any higher boxes because their ICT education has been about using office apps and so on. And they're pretty good at that, to be fair. I've also started asking them not only about their skills, but about their knowledge and about their understanding. And there the picture is more sobering still. Skills is fine, actually, because of the great work that's gone on in school. Knowledge is the one that, sorry, knowledge and understanding, understanding particularly, is the one that really bothers me. What's that? That's just over 20% describe themselves as competent, proficient, or expert when it comes to their understanding of technology. And given where we're heading with the curriculum, that's really quite sobering. We asked them, how do you choose to learn this stuff when it's something new with technology? Do you choose to play, to read, to, or to talk as your preferred learning style? I know the whole learning style thing is largely unhelpful, but I'm Piscean and would think that, wouldn't I? Um, when we do the cross-tab analysis of understanding against learning style, we find that those who play, those who check the explore, experiment, play box, score higher on that measure. What's that? That's close on 30% of them proficient competent, sorry, competent, proficient, or expert on that compared to just over 10% when it's those who like to have somebody there supporting them. For programming, it's a much the same picture. So there's empirical evidence to suggest that those who adopt a more playful, exploratory, experimental approach to learning this stuff seem to be willing to tick a box to say they are better at programming or they have more understanding. So what do we do about it? Well, for our general students, which is the vast majority of the ones we see, 
We do a little bit of work about what the internet is in year one. We play with a little floor turtle, the bee bots. We do some scratch programming, which I can show you some of in year two. We don't have a lot of time with the generalists, to be fair. We use a lovely toolkit called 2DIY. And we also teach them a bit about search in year two. In year three, we do some work with HTML and also some less sort of by hand coding for the web. Um, in the specialist program, we have this lovely year one course on creativity and computing. I'm hoping I'll be allowed to keep the word creativity in the title there. Um, and then year two is very much about developing for web-based learning environments. In year three, we return to some of this and do a little bit about computer science, and they also develop schemes of work. Developing a scheme of work is not rocket science. Okay, it might now be computer science, but it ain't rocket science. PGC program, we don't get much time with our trainees there. We do some work either with robots if they're early years, key stage one, or with HTML by hand if they're key stage two. And then we do Scratch with everybody for the last lecture of the course. Last lecture of the course, we get to play games. So we do Scratch. This is one trainee's interpretation of the internet. We make them use a drawing program, either on the tablets or on the pooters, and say, what does the internet mean to you? And we get some lovely pictures. We get like the front page of Google, or the front page of Facebook, or the front page of YouTube. That is not what the internet is. But this is quite a nice one, isn't it? Connecting the people connecting the world. I think that's a nice way of interpreting that. We've got, this is some of the play which we do with the bee bots. Oh, I should have explained, oops, back a slide please. This, we make them role play a teaching activity as if they were there in class and some of the other trainees get to take on the role of children in reception or early years. So let's have another look. Very impressive, Good. don't you think? Programming a computer, yeah? Store in a program. Two. And of course, we're keeping all of this on long-term storage for when they become head teachers or secretary of states for education. It's going to be worth something then. Um, this is 2DIY, which is not properly coding, but it is getting into developing online, interactive online content, which is almost as good. With a little bit of luck, the website will appear as if by magic scroll, click inside the thing, and we've got to go and eat the healthy food. That looks like healthy food to me. Apparently not. Okay, that's hopefully not going to be too annoying. Oh, it is going to be too annoying. i just got to die, haven't I? <laughs> Let's just move it out of the way. Um, back to the presentation slides. Um, then we do some scratch. Uh, this one, again, should link out onto the interweb. So this is after me explaining... I want to pause it. This is me explaining how to create an animation in Scratch in about 10 minutes. I can kind of get it down to that. One pair of students went off and created their own orrery. It's not a particularly realistic orrery, but not bad after 10 minutes instruction and half an hour's play at it. And I think they would go a lot further creating some really nice teaching resources there. We use Hackasaurus, brought to you by your friends at Mozilla, the people who brought you Firefox. This is not the university's Moodle site, but it is a slightly hacked version of the Moodle site. I think this might have been Group I. Log on to this page and your RP assignment will be awarded 100% pass automatically. Hurry, offer ends in five minutes. Um, what's that at the top right there? New, only for Group I students. Free food will be available all can in the cat canteen every day. Come along. Okay, with Roehampton's canteen, that might not necessarily be seen as a good thing. This is some of the web-based development that they do, so they have to. This is, this is one student's response to what is gained or lost as learning moves from the real to the virtual. She chose to interpret that as a website and so this is her getting started with WordPress and we're going to do some more of that in the teaching and learning assignment later. This is more interesting, believe me. Um, this is the specialist work um, and this is an extended paired project which counts for a lot of points in their first year assignment. They have to take a children's book and create an interactive scratch game based around that. In this case, it's BYOB Scratch, but it's a very similar process. So this is, oops, that'll be my life lost on the other game, won't it? This is, this is some of the coding that goes into that for just one of these sprites here. I think this is an invisible narrator sprite. So with a little bit of luck, I can click on the green flag. 
Okay, not sure the audio is working. Hold on, let's try that once more. Okay, I don't think my audio is working properly. But hopefully you get the idea of the sort of work which they put into that. And that's a multi-screen game. Each, each level has its own particular game mechanic to it. We also get them to create a video essay. This is a short excerpt from one. Again, this is first year undergraduate work. I put some of these principles into practice with my own game design. As an academic exercise, I've worked with a co-designer to create a multimedia game version of Eric Carle's The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Two pairs. I used yeah. games that I play, such as Flow or Flower by Jinhua Chen, as a touchstone to create a new semiotic domain. There is no explicit instruction to the caterpillar that this bubbling quantum vortex will transport him to the next level, or that going too close to the edge of the tree will cause the caterpillar to bounce back. But I expect the young player will pick these clues up and eventually build the playing strategy around the language of interactivity that initially seems mysterious but eventually becomes part of the child's narrative structure. Huge. I was hugely impressed by that. Our students do that every day. Don't know the folk will say. <laughs> right, okay. So um, then again with the third years, we do more of the CS. So we've got here yeah, a couple of them more. No, in Kodu for the first time, which we left for the third year. I think that might have been a mistake. I can see what they were doing at Kids with Kodu earlier on in conference. And then over on the right here, we have somebody who's going on to the Tri Haskell website. Haskell is a really complicated coding language, which like nobody really understands. Um, but he was having a go at that, and something which you could indeed do in primary school. And then the creating the scheme of work thing. So this is trying to bring the whole thing together. Let's knit a scheme of work together. So just one unit where they brought in some of those coding computing ideas. And about five minutes left. <laughs> okay. What do they think about what we do? Well, if you go through all of the comments on their many and various blogs and have a look at all of the ones which mention things like Bbots and Scratch and programming and that sort of computer science type idea, then this is the word all that emerges there. And I just think it's so wonderful that almost any term you search for on these blogs, the key word that comes up time and time again is children, right at the focus of everything which they do. So credit to Roehampton students. Computing, not there, but ICT still in big letters. Scratch, obviously, because we focus a lot on that. Programming is there, but look, learning is there too. So is game. So is creativity, if you look for it. So there's a whole lot of, and, and think is there, which is really, really nice to see. Um, in terms of, of the blog posts themselves, there's, there's a huge amount of content. So just looking for a, through a sample of those and using the TPAC model, the technological pedagogical content um, knowledge approach to this, which expands beyond the pedagogical knowledge, content knowledge that Schumann talks about, um, and looking at example posts, we have this sort of thing. So getting to grips with Scratch is not easy for them. I have a, I should have put it on the slide deck, a really stinky email from a first year saying, you're not teaching us this properly. You should be explaining to us how to do these. No, that's missing the point. Look, I've got statistics to say. You'll, better, you'll learn more if you just play with it. You really will. Um, but it is actually a hard thing. And hard is all right, though. Learning to persevere, learning to overcome difficulties. One of the things which were asked in the National Student Survey, if memory serves, is I have found the course intellectually stimulating, or at least it's on our module evaluations, or intellectually challenging. And it should be yes to that question. A university education should include some things which you do not find easy, rather than just requiring you to work hard. And then, of course, they think about how they're going to how they're learning this and how they're going to teach with this. So really interesting insight from this trainee about how the, the lectures themselves and the workshops haven't been enough. They've had to go and play with it and explore and experiment. And the point which I think Pete made yesterday of all of the coders that he knows are people who've gone and taught themselves how to do this. And this is exactly what I'm kind of hoping for my trainees. And then, of course, they go and use it out on placement and have a whale of a time doing so. You know, yes, many of them now are getting placed into schools where Scratch is already well established and programming is happening, despite what Schmidt and others have said. But they're also the ones who are taking it there and, and doing that sort of innovation thing, which trainees are quite capable of doing. And then others are considering exactly what an ICT education should be about. This is a response to some of Papert's work. 
And then, again, this recognition that it's more than just programming. You can get so much of this through playing games, through thinking about algorithms, and a nod in the direction of the computational thinking stuff rather than merely the craft of coding. And then the overlap between at least some of these sectors. So one here which addresses both pedagogical and content knowledge. So talking about social constructivism, obviously looking for high marks on their blog, the important part of gaming that children don't see that there's more to computer games than what you end up playing as, as the user of that. There are a couple of posts here which address all three of these domains, the technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge, all, one, all aside one another. I do see the value in creating computer games using the likes of Scratch or BYOB. Exciting to use, but a bit frustrating, yeah? Children would need great patience and perseverance. For instance, my angel of death, never mind, don't ask, disappeared off screen. I couldn't figure out how to find him again, which left me very, very angry and ready to yell or swear at the screen. Common experience, folks? Yeah, those of you who develop things? Okay, I can only imagine how frustrated children would get. I would still like to use it, but with small groups of children. So thinking about all three aspects of this. Now is not a good time to be phoning. It's Mark Chambers of all people. It's not going out on the stream, is it? Right. Um, and then similar thing here. This is really interesting. This. So this is a trainee who's got so inspired by Scratch, he's doing the music module here. But rather than using LMMS Linux Multimedia Suite, which is the program he's been invited to use for composing his music, he's chosen to write music in Scratch. And he's making a reasonably convincing case for actually writing music in Scratch would be a great way to bring it into the classroom. So computational thinking, computer science across the curriculum. And Scratch is really pretty good support for music. And so we get kind of to the last few bullet points here. What are the lessons we've learned? What does our experience suggest would be a sensible way to approach, I think, both initial teacher training for computing and some of the computers uh, continuing professional development that we need to do to equip a generation or two of teachers to deal with this new curriculum? Making things is good. Papert got it right all of those years ago. You learn so much through making things, and so many people are interested in making things. We heard this morning about all of the work which Nesta are supporting in that domain. And play is good as well. You know, we still say, I'm playing on the computer. We're allowed to carry on playing when it comes to ICT a little later, and we have to give it up in other subjects. And I think that's particularly true of computing and computer science. I don't think it is as hard as many people looking at the program of study think that it is, certainly not for primary education. But even if it was, hard is not that bad, folks. It really isn't. A little bit of challenge, a little bit of, I don't want to say rigor, but you know what I mean. Something with bite to it isn't a bad thing in primary education or initial teacher training. And yeah, computer science is a science. How do we teach science in primary schools? Or how should we teach science in primary schools? Well, doing experiments and having a model of how reality works and being interested in finding out how reality works and testing that. And so an experimental approach to computer science or coding is important. But yeah, whilst computer science may well be a science, coding itself is a craft and has that sort of sense of, I want to do this as well as I can. And this learning through experience, and I suppose the learning through apprenticeship and the legitimate peripheral participation, that's one of the reasons why Scratch is so lovely. The thing I didn't show you today is this global Scratch website where the young coders who are working in Scratch help one another. And yeah, the computational thinking is really the point of it for, I think, many of us. And that's something which doesn't just happen in your computing lessons or your ICT lessons. You know, the, the example from the previous slide about applying that across the curriculum, I think, is a really powerful one. <sighs> and breathe. I'm Miles Berry. Um, I'm going to hang around if you want to come and chat about any of this, but I think people are going to want their cream tea, or at least their cup of tea, to take a cup of tea. So feel free to just go. I'm not going to take questions. I don't think